So uh, thank you guys for coming. This is my uh, relational database design and implementation workshop. So in this workshop, we're going to be going over relational databases. Uh, and we will be at the end implementing our own relational database and linking it with a, uh, with a Java application so we can interact with it and play around. So without further ado, uh, let's, let's begin. No, that was not what I wanted. Here we go. Okay, so this is just some topics I want to talk about. Um, data and databases, and oh, we'll just skip this, <laughs> I'll just get into it. Um, so forefront, what's so good about data? So data has been a really popular topic um, starting in the, coming with the, the 21st century. I mean, it, it kind of always has been a decent topic, but very much now in the, in the 21st century. Uh, we hear a lot of companies talking about like utilizing big data and, and people making like data-driven decisions in science and, and all these cool little buzz terms and, and things that kind of just float around um, about data. So uh, in that case, why is data really that important? Like, what are we doing with it? Um, and as a quick definition, uh, I, I always saw in on Google and whatnot, data is just a collection of observed facts that are taken to be correct, right? So we have like measurements or, or you know, uh, data from, from people, if you ask them like a survey or something, it's a bunch of different types of data, uh, numerical and then categorical, which is not just non-numerical really, but a lot of different types. So let's get into why we need data. Uh, we use data to create breakthroughs in artificial intelligence most recently on uh, the last close to two decades now since Deep learning has become really significant. Uh, machine learning has always been somewhat significant, but deep learning, which is just these models that need tons and tons of data, have become really prevalent because we just have a bunch of data floating around now. Um, relevant in science, you know, uh, using data from uh, observ observations of stars and astronomy, you know, astrophysics, a bunch of that stuff. Uh, in business, the stock market, uh, finance, um, trying to pretty much like optimized profits, optimization's a big one that you use data with, um, criminal justice, they can use all these different types of models and, and all these different types of things with data to, uh, you know, um, make better decisions. So uh, if data is so important to our success, as we've seen here, um, you know, we have so many breakthroughs with it all the time, it's really involved in nearly every facet of our life, uh, do we have enough? And I alluded to that before. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. So this is a projected chart that I got from online, uh, like a professional uh, statistics, I guess, database or whatever database. Um, and they measured the projected growth from 2010 to 2025. And there's a growth of 175 zettabytes, um, zettabyte being 1,000 terabytes, one zettabyte being 1,000 terabytes uh, to 2025. And uh, you could definitely see there uh, the graph is showing an exponential rate. So the rate of the the, the amount of data on, in the world is is growing exponentially. And this is only from 2010. Um, before that, I, I couldn't actually find a good graph for that that I could display. But I wanted to find one more along more in the long of like the lines of 1970 to 2010. Pretty much with the advent of the internet, which is around the 70s and the 80s, the amount of data that we just have is, is you know astronomical. So um, the, the, the real question then comes with, um, with so much data that we can use to gain insights, um, how do we manage it? How do we store it, right? Like, you know, a bunch of, you hear the word data, it's so, it's so abstract sometimes, you can't really even think about it. You got to have, it's like, all right, is it numerical, categorical? Is it structured in some way? Or is it just floating around? How do we measure it? Like all, all this stuff that goes into it. And the answer is databases. So we can use databases to organize, manage, and interact uh, with the just huge astronomical quantities of data that are available to us thanks to uh, mainly the internet, uh, the advent of the internet. And by using databases, we're able to, you know, uh, make queries of the data that we have, which means we could find like relevant insights from them. We could organize them. We could structure them to optimize, uh, you know, our our use of data really. Um, and, and out of those two, or out of, in databases, there are two main types. There's relational and non-relational. Relational databases being the ones that we're going to cover in this presentation. But for now, let's 
let's talk about maybe the difference between relational and non-relational. Um, oh, that's unfortunate. I had a video there and I think it just got blocked from something. Give me one second, sorry. Why did that get blocked? Oh, sorry. <laughs> there it is. My bad. <laughs> Alright, gotta start that again. I guess I started talking about it. I didn't notice. Okay, going back on track. I wanted to talk about relational and non-relational a little bit first before I watch the video. Uh, so relational databases, let's get into that. This is the first type of database. So a relational database, um, you could also refer to that as a uh, relational database management system or a SQL database. Stores data in tables and rows, also referred to as records, and you can see that here. We have this um, this dog table, I guess you could call it, Fido, Rex, and it's determining whether uh, they get dry or wet food. Is a good boy, yes or no? Uh, you have this this tag, this kind of, I guess, I don't know what this table will be called, maybe like a measurements database. You have tag number, height, weight, and then uh, stuff about you know their age and breed and whatnot. So pretty much organized in, in tables, and each record in this table is a, uh, a data point or you know a row. So you can see like, oh, okay, Fido has dry food, he's a good boy. While Cujo down here is wet, and he's not a good boy. <laughs> and relational databases uh, really kind of work by linking information through uh, these things called keys, which are unique identifiers, which can be assigned to a row of data contained within a table. So pretty much these keys are used to kind of relate between two tables, which is where the word relational comes from. And, and, and a good amount of these that you'd see in the real world, these relational database management systems, a good, more, the more popular ones are ones like MySQL, which we'll be working with a little bit today, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, Postgres, and then SQLite as well. Now getting to non-relational databases. So non-relational databases, and they're also called uh, NoSQL, uh, they store data. However, just like a relational database, but however, they, uh, unlike relational databases, there are no tables, rows, or keys. What they really do is they store unstructured data and they optimize the storage um, that they use or the way that they structure it for specific uses. So there are four popular non relational types there's a document data store, column oriented database, a key value score, uh, store, and graph database. Um, a little bit on the key value store, that's probably the one I've seen the most with, uh, with non-relational, and they always use uh, this for like JSON files because they're built on this whole key value um, system. So I always see that, and some of those popular ones that use those types of non-relational uh, databases are MongoDB, Apache Cassandra, uh, Redis, I, don't, I never knew how to pronounce that one, but Couchbase, and then Apache HBase. I'm not going to talk about, again, too much of this, but um, we'll get into it in the video, and the focus is more on this relational. So without further ado, let's, let's get into this video and, and get a better kind of insight into uh, how they work. I think I actually have to exit out the slideshow and click this, though, if I am correct. Now if it could load, that would be amazing. Oh uh, boy. All right, let me see here. Give me one second while I figure this out. Okay, it looks like the link isn't working, so I'll just pull up the video here and share it. There we go. You guys can still see the video. Just want to make sure I didn't X out anything or anything like that. I think it's good. Okay, so let's play it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tech in Five Minutes. There is no doubt that databases are a crucial element of any IT system. You may also know there are two main types of databases relational and non relational. But could you tell the core difference between them? Let's take a closer look. What's a relational database? A relational database is a database that forms relations between tables that store data on specific entities. 
A relational database uses SQL, structured query language. What's a non-relational database? No SQL databases are more flexible because the data on the object isn't limited to the same table. Non-relational databases use columns and rows to enter types of data and its values, and identify objects with keys. Now let's look into pros and cons of each type based on the Gelbix team experience. Advantages of a relational database. Simplicity. Data accuracy, as you need to sort through every piece of data. Easy access to data. Data integrity, as all entries are checked on their validity. Flexibility. You can create new relations between tables without violating the existing data structure. And of course, security. By the way, if you'd like to know more about ensuring software security, check the link in the description box. We have a good guide on the topic. Getting back to relational databases, it is important to mention their cons. They may have performance issues. Its setup could take a long time, and there is no support for complex data types. As for advantages of a non-relational database, we can think of handling unstructured data, agility, teams can quickly update documents, readability. When you need to get all data on a user, it's enough to open an individual document. There's no need to shift between multiple tables. Most NoSQL solutions are open source. Disadvantages of a non-relational database are dependency on a specific database management system, limited functionality, and hiring difficulties. Let's now see the examples of relational databases. First comes MySQL. MySQL is used by many content management systems, including WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, and is perhaps the most popular relational database. It is also used by YouTube, Flickr, Twitter, and lots of projects our team handles. Some of MySQL functionality include performance monitoring, support of Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and other systems, password encryption, and great performance of up to 50 million data rows. Though it is an excellent tool, it has some disadvantages, including slow data traction and weak debugging algorithms. Microsoft SQL Server. Its main functionality include in-memory analytics, by semantic model, customization capabilities, integration with Oracle databases, error management, and others. Its disadvantages are expensive licensing plans, Windows-based servers only, Oracle database. Oracle hosted its database in the cloud. It is mainly used to transition to cloud computing and run cloud computing for web projects. This database provides four levels of data transaction protection, group transactions, real application cluster that allows connecting many servers to the same database, and multi-OS support. It does have its cons, namely, high price. It's difficult to find an Oracle database development team, and it's not so easy to learn and use. By the way, people often say that Oracle's is the most complicated database to use. Do you agree with that statement? Share your thoughts in the comments. IBM DB2. IBM's DB2 is one of the oldest and most mature relational database solutions. Its key functionality include powerful SQL modification, efficient memory handling, and support of IBM infrastructure. Its disadvantages? It requires a lot of necessary add-ons to unlock its full functionality. The free IBM support is only available for the first three years, then it becomes paid. Let's now move on to the examples of non-relational databases. The first one here is MongoDB. This is the most popular non-relational database, and our team uses it often too. Its functionality includes the support of various data types and the ability to distribute data automatically between different servers. MongoDB also boasts fast performance. Among its disadvantages, we'd like to mention that MongoDB requires more memory increasingly. There is no control of duplication. And finally, we are noticing the lack of documentation. The next database is DocumentDB. It's managed and developed by Amazon. The database service can be integrated with MongoDB. Also, it provides database migration, monitoring capabilities, automatic updates, and automatic storage increases. As for disadvantages, Amazon DocumentDB is very similar to MongoDB, so it also shares the same drawbacks. There's also no control of duplication, scarce educational resources, and the database isn't organized well. It's possible that as your project scales, documents will become a lot messier. Next, Cassandra. It was created by the Facebook team. It is known for its scalability, 
support of unstructured, structured, and semi-structured data, and the support for multiple data centers. On the other hand, it has no asset support and aggregate support, and also latency problems. Cassandra is not good at reading high volumes of data simultaneously. So how can you choose a database? To make it easier, we prepared four questions based on our own experience. What type of data will you be analyzing? If you are working with a lot of factual and numeric data, the SQL database will be a good bet. However, if your application is handling a large amount of messy data, you need to pick a flexible solution that doesn't prioritize structure over performance. How much data are you dealing with? If you are dealing with huge amounts of data, a non-relational database is a better choice. Are you ready to invest time and budget in the setup of your database? If you are ready to invest early on the project, you can choose an SQL solution. It's harder to set up, but later on, it pays off. Non-relational databases, on the contrary, are easier to set up, but when it comes to long-term support, you need to be sure that you have a reliable vendor. Do you need real-time data? If you are working with real-time data, no SQL databases will provide you with more flexibility and save a lot of time on the input stage. To conclude, the choice between relational and non-relational databases depends on your project's priorities and team skills. If you are in a struggle, Jelvix database experts can help you make a choice. Moreover, we offer a wide range of services, such as software development, UI UX design, testing, and IT consulting. Find our contact information in the description. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so going back to this slideshow. Yeah, so from that, um, <clears throat> from that video, you kind of get the whole idea of relational versus non-relational databases. And he did mention something interesting, which was um, you want to pick them depending on your project. There really is no... People debate whether relational versus non-relational, which one's better, but it really yeah, it depends on your project. And to give you an example, a lot of organizations use relational databases because of their structure and this thing called ACID, which he brought up in, in, the, in the video, which stands for uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And these four things are pretty much guaranteed um, in relational databases, which pretty much mean that your data is structured well and that um, you have no like kind of random dependencies that are going to screw things up. Your data is safe and it's, and it's secure. Uh, while with non-relational databases, they're faster. Um, they're easier to set up, as you said, but they do not and they don't ensure that the acid properties are withheld or are maintained because they're just, you know, they're, they're fast and loose in that sense. Like for an example, I had used MongoDB for a project where I found that I was saving a lot of files just to my working directory, and they were JSON files. So I was like, wait a minute, why don't I just use a NoSQL database or, or a non-relational database? Because that's what it's for, right? <laughs> I'm not scaling this to a huge project, but maybe if I was coming up with a business with millions of users and things like that, maybe I wouldn't want to have a NoSQL database. Maybe I'd want to have a SQL database. And I'm using this term SQL a lot, and I will get to that in a little bit. Any questions so far? If you have any questions, just let me know in the chat. Interrupt me, it's fine. So just some relational database definitions that I probably mentioned already, but some of them I might not have, so let's just get into that. So a table is a set of data related uh, to each other. So it's a subset of a database. So when you think of a table, you can think of this almost like a class in, in object-oriented programming. Right, so if I use a table, like I have a user's table, right? You might have a user's class or a user class or, or a person table, and I might have a person class that I wanna create in an OOP. Um, schema is the design of your entire database. The word schema, when you talk about database schema, can be mixed up sometimes. Sometimes it could just mean um, like how your table is represented, like the whole big picture of your table, or it can mean the whole big picture of your database, what's in your database really. It's kind of a loaded word, but um, just know that when I mentioned schema, it's usually about you know uh, the layout of your database. Uh, row slash record slash tuple, these are single entries in a table. So if you could think, well, maybe I don't wanna make that analogy, but think when you think of a row, like in Excel, actually that's a, that's a perfect example. Um, you think of rows in Excel, 
you have uh, these rows and each row would be considered a data record, right? So if I had a user's table and I had a user named John Smith, uh, first row, first column, it would be like first name, John. Um, it would be second row, first column, Smith, and then whatever else information. So each row is, is, a, um, is a data record. And then we have these columns also called fields and attributes, which are uh, single categories in a table. Uh, so, you know, maybe, you know, first name would be for John, if I had a, a, a person table, first name would be a attri an attribute, last name would be an attribute, maybe age. And uh, these two things are actually really cool with um, with OOP because they kind of go hand in, they kind of really good analogies of one another. You can think of a data record as a class instance, right? Um, I have a record for John Smith. I can create an object of person called, you know, with the name John Smith. And fields and attributes, well, those are exactly like they would be in like OOP. You have, you know, fields and attributes or, or attributes and members, I guess you would call them in, in OOP. And in um, when it comes to databases, those are just your, your column names. You're, you're pretty much those things that kind of go along with the, um, the data records. So John Smith is age is going to be 40. So like age would be the column. So the structured query language, I've been mentioning this a lot. So that's what SQL stands for. It is also pronounced SQL. I've been pronouncing it SQL for far too long because that's how I always was told to pronounce it. But I guess people decided to go back to SQL, which makes more sense, but I don't know. <laughs> so let's go through this. So we know that relational databases organize data using tables and that uh, these tables have rows and they represent the records and the columns represent the fields and whatnot, we were just talking about that, right? So the question comes, how do we pretty much like manage this? How do we do basic CRUD operations? CRUD being like, you know, create, remove, update, delete. How do, I, how do we manage and organize this, this database? We use SQL or SQL. So we do this using the structured lang uh, querying language, which is better known as SQL, and it's a programming language to manage contents in a relational database. And with SQL, we can manage our relational databases with ease. So here's some basic SQL syntax. We have this uh, select keyword, which extracts data from a database. Update updates the database, delete deletes. Insert into is used to insert new values into a database for a specific table. Create database, alter database. Create table, alter table, drop table, all basic stuff. You also notice that if you've never seen SQL before or SQL, whatever you want to call it, um, it's very, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, English. It's very English looking. Like you, you, you're used to in, in programming languages really having kind of like these obscure terms that you're kind of spelling out for a lot of the time, but you'll see that it, it reads pretty well uh, English wise. So here are some examples of SQL statements, some basic ones. So, for example, this is how I was talking about how it reads English. Create database and then name, you know, whatever the name of my database is. This is just used to create a database. Create table name, same thing. Creates table called, you know, whatever name specified. Drop database name, it just deletes the database. Drop table, it deletes the table with that name. Select all, or sorry, select asterisks from table. Uh, this returns all the records from the specified table, and the asterisk there indicates all, right? So in my example before, I had uh, a, a user's table, right? So maybe I could say select, you know, um, and users had last name. So I could put, maybe I could do select last name from users, and I would get all the last names um, of, the, of the data records in the table currently. I have this where clause or this where uh, keyword here. So I'll use that same, that same uh, statement that I had before, the select all from table. So I could do select, again, last name we'll use as an example, select last name from table. And then I could say where age equals like 40, right? And what that will do, it'll execute the above statement, though it'll filter it to only have those data records where um, the age of the, the, the data record that's specified by age is 40 years old. So it's kind of like a Boolean condition where like you have an if statement and kind of regular programming languages. Um, it's the exact kind of same thing. Insert into table and then attribute names, values, attribute data. This is how uh, you would pretty much insert stuff into your 
database table. So if I had a users table, I could have like, you know, this statement, I could say like insert into users, you know, John Smith 40, and then, you know, or like uh, first name, last name, age, and then John Smith 40 as the values. Alter table, um, add attribute. You can just add new attributes to uh, a table. You can also remove them. Um, delete from table, you could delete. This, this one's interesting. Delete from table. This doesn't actually delete the table. It just deletes all the records. So if you have a table like users and you're like, all right, well, my business just burned down to the ground, so I have to restart from scratch. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you just get rid of all those data records because you're starting fresh. So here's some basic SQL data types, um, putting an emphasis on the word basic because this is nowhere near exhaustive of all the SQL data types that are available to you. These are just the basic ones that I would use pretty often. So char, and then we have this size argument here. And what this is, is this is a fixed length string. It contains letters, numbers, special characters, and then you have a size between zero and 255. So that is your basic, 8 bit, yeah, 8 bit. Um, pretty much um, string at, at that point. Um, so, this is useful for stuff that you know is going to be like, <laughs> this is for stuff that you know is going to be like exact size. So, for example, um, maybe you have like a middle name field in your database. Maybe you have a person, you have a middle name field. You know, uh, you could put char size one, right, or something like that, so, because you know that each time it should just be like, a single letter. So you don't have to worry about, you know, varying sizes. Varchar size. So this is a variable length string, right? So it contains the same thing um, that char does, except that it's bigger and you can also um, not fill up the whole thing. So for example, I have this first name attribute. I could set varchar 30 and that means it could have 30 characters, but maybe my name, my name is just, you know, Matthew. So that's, that's not going to take up 30 characters, but that doesn't matter. Get out of here, notification. Um, so, yeah, that's Varchar. Uh, int size, this is a medium integer for our specific purposes. You kind of kind of just ignore the medium integer, except know that there are a bunch of other data types that are numeric, and that's why it says medium. Uh, this is the one I use the most. So um, if you uh, use this, it it's pretty much has a big range, like you would see in normal programming languages. I don't know what power of two that number is supposed to be, so don't don't uh <laughs> don't ask me. Uh unsigned range, yeah. So you could do just like unsigned and then you do like in C. If you want to not do negatives, you could just pretty much double that and have that same effect. Um you don't always have to specify the size. I actually don't know what int defaults to. I think it might default to just an 8 bit. Um but yeah so that would be that. Uh, decimal, right? So this is like your your floats or your doubles in programming languages. It's um, an exact fixed point number because int only uh, allows you to have float um, non floating point numbers, so integer numbers. Um, again, the specified uh, size is with that size field, um, and the D parameter specifies the number of digits you want to um, provide uh, in the decimal. So maybe you want it to be up to three decimal places. You would have like decimal size and then maybe like three or something, right? Um, the maximum number for size is 65. Uh, honestly, I don't really use decimal that much. Uh, <laughs> I just thought I'd put it in there. That's probably more for like someone who uses a bunch of scientific calculations and whatnot uh, as far as decimal goes in, in a database. And date time. This was one I wanted to put in because I think it's interesting because you always kind of have want to have this concept of time. Um, or, or like start date or end date or something in a database to keep records. This is just one of the date data types that are available to you. Um, this is in SQL. Specifically, this is MySQL, but a lot of these data types uh, pretty much carry over to different versions of database management systems. So we had mentioned MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server before, uh, Oracle, DB2. All these ones have like little changes, but most of the data types are the same. And for this data type, which I think is actually just independent of what database management system you're using, it's it's the form uh, year, month, day, hours, minutes, second. So, for example, um, you know, it goes from here to here, and uh, it's a pretty big range.
So here we have a sample table called customers, and I uh, got this from online. So if I do this statement, I say select customer name city from customers, this returns all the customer name and city data currently in the database. So if you could think about it, is it's pretty much selecting that whole column of customer name and returning all of the data currently in there as well as city. Using this, this where clause for um, a similar Similar query, I'm saying select all, which is that asterisk means all, and select all from customers where country equals Germany. This returns all records that indicate Germany as the country. So we can see this little com uh, country field here. And so pretty much I would get the data records, because remember I selected all, that asterisk, select all from customers. So I would get this data record uh, where the country is Germany. So it would filter out all the other countries. Select all from customers where country equals Germany or country equals Mexico. This is pretty much the same thing. It's it's Boolean logic, right? We have this, you can call it an yeah, inclusive or, the default or, right? It was who it would be. Returns all those data records that are either Germany or Mexico. And then you have your basic and as well. So select all from customers where country equals Germany and city equals Berlin. So now I'm getting back those data records because again, I, I use the asterisk, I use all those data records where the country is Germany and filter out all of those that don't have Berlin as the city. So you're, you're again, doing this, I guess you can call it an exclusive and, I don't really know. <laughs> I guess it was an inclusive, yeah. The, the regular and you would see in it in like programming or anything like that, in Boolean algebra and whatnot. So now let's talk about keys. I mentioned keys before and, and I didn't get too much into them. So we're gonna get into them now. So keys are what really um, drive the whole relational database concept. Um, pretty much this is, this is how we relate. Uh, different tables in our database. Without them, this wouldn't be a thing. <laughs> so a primary key is a column or a set of columns in a table whose values uniquely identify around the table. And the relational database model is designed to enforce the uniqueness of primary keys by allowing only one row with a given primary key value in a table. So for example, um, we could see here that we have you could see this course ID. This is the primary key of this table. So we have this course ID and this course name. If we go up here, we have this student table. We have this student ID. I can tell that's the primary key here. Foreign key, a foreign key is a column or set of columns at a table whose values correspond to the values of the primary key in another table. So what does that mean? So let's explain this because this could be a little bit confusing, but um, I, I think it, it, it makes sense if you just kind of look at it. So. I can see that there's a relationship right here, right? They, they indicate a relationship. And I said before, the primary key here is course ID. And I'm like, okay, so the primary key is being specified as course ID, right? How can I do this? To, how can I use this information to relate a table? Well, on student, I what I do is I put this course ID column in here, which is the same thing as this primary key in this table, but I add it to this table. And since I said we already have a primary key in the student table, which is the student ID, this is what is called a foreign key. And what this foreign key does is it pretty much says, oh, okay, uh, in student, we have to have some way to represent or to, to relate what course the student is taking, but we don't want to, you know, have to include all the data about the course every time in the table. This is a student table. It's not like I don't want to keep repeating data over and over again. So what I do is I have this course table. I'm like, okay. Uh, we have a whole list of courses here. Put the course ID, which is the foreign key in here, and now they're connected to that course. So it makes sense. You know, it's it's you're pretty much relating and connecting these two tables. So now that when you have a data record, so Jim Black has C002, and um, he is taking computing, and now they're related. An interesting thing that uh, occurs, or I guess you could say a consequence of this relationship, is um, that once you pretty much have a foreign key relationship, the if I tried to delete right now computing, right, and I just tried to delete it from the database, um, the relational database management system would not let me. And why is that? Well, it's because uh, Jim Black right here, he's referring to this, this course ID. So if I tried to delete this record, I'm gonna have this random course ID that doesn't mean anything, right? And that, you know, now we have data that doesn't mean anything. 
you know, it, it's just inaccurate. And this is like, why is it still here? We have no idea what this is. So you're just not allowed to do that. And what that really is called is referential integrity. You pretty much have to delete any record that depends on this uh, this relationship before you were to actually delete the um, the record here. So if I could sum up in a sentence, any table whose primary key is a foreign key in another table, um, all the records that depend on it must be deleted before it's deleted, if, if that makes sense. I think we could kind of get into that a little more here. So I have these two tables here, a patient and an appointment. Uh, we have our primary key that I specified in here for each table, which is this primary key patient ID, this primary key appointment ID. And, um, you know, patients usually have appointments, right? So maybe I want to relate these. Um, how, do, how do I do that? And uh, the answer is keys. So what I did here, as you can see in the previous example as well, is that in the appointments table, I added this uh, patient ID into the appointments table. So now when I refer to that, I say, okay, I have an appointment. Maybe I know the time. It's at 3 o'clock. And, oh, patient with patient ID like 11001, which is maybe another patient, uh, it pretty much is related to this appointment. And then it says, hey, yeah, okay, so they're related. We can make a relation between them because um, this is the primary key here. And again, say I wanted to delete, let's just use our John Smith example again. So John Smith has the patient ID of 11001. He has appointment at three o'clock. Um, and I try to delete John Smith. I cannot do that because this appointment depends on John Smith's data record. So what I have to do is this thing called a cascading delete, which I which I alluded to before. That's the that's the term for it, a cascading delete, which pretty much deletes anything that depends on John Smith's data record or his primary key in their table before I can delete John Smith. So what I would have to do if I want to delete John Smith, I would delete the appointment first that has John Smith's dependency on it, and then I would come back and delete uh, John Smith. And when you have a bunch of keys flying all over the place in a database, which if it can be avoided, I would definitely say do that because <laughs> you shouldn't have keys can get messy. Um, you have to delete all the things first. And if you have other keys just flying around everywhere, it can get pretty bad. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's referential integrity for you. And that's, uh, that's cascading deletes. And that's keys. Um, one more thing I want to mention too. You might see that I have in all of my uh, tables this patient ID or appointment ID and all these IDs as primary keys. So this is what I would call a synthetic key. There's a, there's a name for it. I don't, can't pick it out on top of my tongue. But this is kind of like a key that's just randomly made. Because anything really can be a key as long as it's unique. And when you're picking a primary key, you want a key that really doesn't change and it's unique to every single data record. And maybe they could say, okay, why don't I make first name or last name or, or you know, date started or, or, or you know, address or something as, as a primary key. Well, those things can change, even though you might not think about it. Those things can change, whether they're typos, things like that. So when you have a generated patient ID or something like an ID that can't be changed after it's generated, you know this will never change and this will never have to touch your primary key. And that's integral to using a relational database. You never want to touch those. Um, they are they are there to stay. So make sure you use these kind of synthetic keys rather than something where it's like a, you know, I think they call it surrogate key. I think it's what they call it uh, instead of like these real world kind of attributes. That's that's. I've heard stories of people using these, and it just is not fun when you get into problems. So here's an exercise. Uh, to the right, I have one data record in the patient table, which is John Smith with patient ID. 11001, and then I have this appointment ID. I put 255. I wonder why I did that. Um, I put uh, right before Y2K, apparently, <laughs> and uh, put patient ID 11001. So here, again, this is our primary key for John Smith for that, for that patient. And here, I've added it as a foreign key to this appointment, so they're related. And now my question is, if I wanted to delete John Smith from the patient table, how would I go about doing that? And I simply delete his record from the database. Can someone answer? Feel free to shout out or type in the chat. I see people typing, so. It's 
So race to the finish line. Who's going to submit first? Uh, delete where patient ID. Yeah, okay, you have the... I wasn't actually even looking for code, but yeah. The, the idea is there, yeah. So you'd want to delete the, the appointment row first, right? Because um, if we tried to delete John Smith again, you have to do a cascading delete. If I tried to delete John Smith, we'd have a floating patient ID with a random, uh, you know, a patient ID that doesn't exist anymore. So again, we have to get rid of this first, and then once this has no more relationships uh, or in no more, its key isn't flying around our database anymore, then we can delete it. So I think I should say that, yeah. So delete John Smith's record from the patient table. Must first delete his appointment record as is related using the foreign key. If I try to do so, SQL prohibit me from doing it. And I have this relation kind of arrow there. Okay, so now let's get into table design. Um, this is a basic table that I had written up before, and uh, it's just for our, for our patient. And this is correct uh, uh, MySQL or MySQL uh, structure. I, I wrote it like this and I ran it and it works all nice and well. Um, and I was saying here, tables are very similar to class definitions. We define the table, which has attributes and create instances of the table in the forms of rows. And then we get to these attributes that I have. So I have a primary key specified here, first name, last name, age, phone number, et cetera. Uh, I said, okay, uh, let's create two more tables now. Let's create a doctor and then an appointment table. And uh, same thing, really. We have our, our doctor ID, first name, last name, age, starting date, which is a date, and then appointment, appointment ID, appointment time, update time, room number, all this fun stuff. Uh, this is pretty simple. You could definitely add more tables and, and more things here and then do some fun stuff. But this is pretty simple, and this is fine for right now. Is our design perfect? Uh, unfortunately, our database schema right now is a little redundant. So if I go back, I will point out something um, redundant here with doctor. Uh, we have phone number here in doctor, as well as phone number here in patient. Um, so these two fields kind of being in separate tables, even though they can be related to one another, is kind of redundant. We'd be kind of just not optimizing our database. That's one example. And uh, a solution to that would be why not just create a phone number table and use foreign keys to relate a doctor or patient to a phone number rather than having it entered into the actual table each time for each one. Um, so this concept of minimizing data redundancy is called a database normalization. And you can think of it really as like, I, I just generated this little task. It, it's, it's almost like trying to print out like hello world like a billion times uh, rather than just using like a for loop in Java or something. Because it really is like, you know, if you're just repeating yourself all over the database, then like, that's just ugly. You don't want to do that. You want to be optimized. You want to be just specific and store as little as you need to. So database normalization. Database normalization, the exact definition, is the process of structuring a database in accordance with a series of so-called normal forms in order to reduce data redundancy and improve data integrity. It was first proposed by Edgar F. Codd to the left as part of his relational model. He was a I guess a researcher at IBM who wrote about this in the in the 19, actually, sorry, wrong guy. The guy who developed relational databases was from IBM. I don't know where this guy is from. He's from nowhere. Um, <laughs> sorry, he, he's probably a good guy. I don't know. Normalization entails organizing the columns and tables of a database to ensure that their dependencies and are properly enforced by database integrity constraints. So I have a video as well for this, which I'll probably have to open up separately now because I know the first one didn't work. But maybe this one's different. Maybe this one maybe this one works. No? Okay. So I'll just open up that video again. There we go. Okay. Bring this over. Okay. Data in the database is stored in terms of enormous quantity. Retrieving certain data will be a tedious task if the data is not organized correctly. 
With the help of normalization, we can organize this data and also reduce the redundant data. Hey guys, this is Pratik from Edureka and I welcome you all to this interesting session on normalization in SQL. In this session, I'll explain everything that is related to normalization with simple examples that are easy to remember. Firstly, let's look at the agenda for today's session. So we're going to start off with understanding normalization. And moving further, we shall look at various types of normalization. And those are first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, and voice code normal form. I hope you guys are clear with the agenda. But before moving further, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, then do subscribe to never miss out an update. With that being said, let's get started. The first topic in today's session is what is normalization? Database normalization is a technique of organizing the data in the database. It is a systematic approach of decomposing tables to eliminate data redundancy. It is a multi-step process that puts data into tabular form, removing the duplicated data from its relational tables. On the screen, we just saw that the table is getting decomposed into two smaller tables. Is it really necessary to normalize the table that is present on the database? Well, every table in the database has to be in the normal form. So normalization is used mainly for two purposes. The first one is, it is used to eliminate repeated data. Having repeated data in the system not only makes the process slow, but will cause trouble during the later part of transactions. The second one is, to ensure the data dependencies make some logical sense. Yes, usually the data is stored in database with certain logic. Huge data sets without any purpose are completely waste. It's like having an abundant resource without any application. The data that we have should make some logical sense. Normalization came into existence because of the problems that occurred on data. Now, let's look at those problems. And these are known as data anomalies. If a table is not properly normalized and has data redundancy, then it will not only eat up the extra memory space, but will also make it difficult to handle and update the database. Let's look at the first anomaly, that is insertion anomaly. Suppose for a new position in a company, Mr. Rakshit is selected, but the department has not been allotted for him. In that case, if we want to update his information to the database, we need to set the department information as null. Similarly, if we have to insert data of 1000 employees who are in similar situation, then the department... Just want to stop this for a quick second, because <clears throat> I know people will get confused if I don't say this. The word null is used in SQL and SQL, and it's probably the worst use I have ever seen. So null in, in regular programming languages like Java and, and C and, and all these other languages just means um, kind of like not present, right? Like it's a null value, nothing is in there, it's nothing. Whereas in SQL, they will use null as unknown, right? So when I'm defining my table, if you remember from earlier, I was using this term null or not null. That really just means that we either know it or don't know it. So if I specify, you know, first name, varchar, 30, uh, not null, that means that, no, it's known, and you have to input it when you input the record that's, that's required for this table. Uh, if I put middle initial uh, char size of one null, that means, well, it's unknown because, and then from a practical standpoint, you know, maybe some people don't have a middle name or don't want to put it, so it's just unknown. If it's there, great, we have it. But other than that, null just means it's unknown. We don't, we don't know about it unless it's given to us. Again, horrible use of the word, but that's what it is. Information will be repeated for all those thousand employees. This scenario is a classical example of insertion anomalies. The next one is update anomaly. What if Mr. Rakshit leaves the company or is no longer the head of the marketing department? In that case, all the employee records will have to be updated. And if by mistake we miss any record, it will lead to data inconsistency. This is nothing but updation anomaly. And the final one is deletion anomaly. In our employee table, two different pieces of information are kept together. That is employee information and department information. Hence, at the end of financial year, if employee records are deleted, we will also lose the department information. This is nothing but deletion anomaly. So these were some of the problems that occurred while managing the data. To eliminate all these anomalies, normalization came into existence. 
there are many normal forms which are still under development but let's focus on the very basic and the essential ones only so we will be talking about first normal form second normal form third normal form and finally end this session with voice chord normal form so without wasting further time let's proceed to first normal form in first normal form we tackle the problem of atomicity here atomicity means values in the table should not be further divided in simple terms a single cell cannot hold multiple values if a table contains a composite or multi valued attributes it violates the first normal form so the following functions will be performed in first normal form the first one is it removes repeating groups from the table and next it creates a separate table for each set of related data and finally it identifies each set of related data with the primary key to understand this in a better way let's look at the given table in the employee table we have employee id employee name phone number and salary as columns we can clearly see that the phone number column has two values thus it violates the first normal form now if we apply the first normal form to the above table we get the following result in this table each and every row is distinct that is no cell has multiple values the table has achieved atomicity first normal form is simple and can be easily identified in the table we can clearly see there is no multiple values in each and every column thus the first normal form is achieved now let's move to second normal form second normal form was originally defined by ef cord in 1971 A table is said to be in second normal form only when it fulfills the following condition. The first condition is it has to be in first normal form. Second one is the table also should not contain partial dependency. Here partial dependency means the proper subset of a candidate key determines a non-prime attribute. So what is a non-prime attribute? Let's understand this in a simple way. Attributes that form a candidate key in a table are called prime attributes. and the rest of the attributes of the relation are non prime for a table prime attributes can be like employee id and department id the non prime attributes can be like office location to understand second normal form let's consider this table this table has a composite primary key that is employee id and department id makes the primary key the non key attribute is office location in this case office location only depends on department id which is only the part of primary key therefore this table does not satisfy the second normal form so what to do in such scenario the answer is simple split the table accordingly to bring this table to second normal form we need to break the table into two parts which will give the following tables the first table has employee id and department id as columns second one has department id and office location as columns as you can see we have removed the partial functional dependency that we initially had now in the table the column office location is fully dependent on the primary key of that table which is nothing but department id i hope you have understood second normal form now that we have learned first normal form and second normal form let's head to the next part of this normalization next topic is third normal form third normal form is a normal form that is used in normalizing the table to reduce the duplication of data and ensure referential integrity the following condition has to be met by the table to be in third normal form and the first condition is the table has to be in second normal form and the second condition is no non prime attribute is transitively dependent on any non prime attribute which depends on other non prime attributes i know it's a bit confusing so let me make it simple for you It's like if C is dependent on B and in turn B is dependent on A then transitively C is dependent on A this should not happen in third normal form all the non prime attributes must depend only on the prime attributes so these are the two necessary condition that needs to be attained so why was third normal form designed firstly to eliminate undesirable data anomalies next one is to reduce the need for restructuring over time finally to make the data model more informative since we have understood the third normal form let's look at the example table in the above table student id determines subject id and subject id determines subject therefore student id determines subject via subject id 
This implies that we have transitive functional dependency. And this table does not satisfy the third normal form. Now, in order to achieve third normal form, we need to divide the table as shown below. Firstly, let's divide the table and store student ID, student name, subject ID, and address in it. All the columns are referring to the primary key, which is student ID. Let the second table have subject ID and subject column. So, subject is dependent only on subject ID and not on student ID. As you can see from the above table, all the non-key attributes are now fully functionally dependent only on the primary key. In the first table, columns such as student name, subject ID, and address are only dependent on student ID. In the second table, subject is only dependent on subject ID. With this being understood, now we can proceed further to next normal form, that is voice code normal form. This is also known as 3.5 normal form. It is the higher version of third normal form and was developed by Raymond F. Boyce and Edgar F. Cord to address certain types of anomalies which were not dealt with third normal form. Before proceeding to voice code normal form, the table has to satisfy third normal form. In voice code normal form, if every functional dependency, that is A implies B, then A has to be the super key of that particular table. So what is a super key? A super key is a group of single or multiple keys which identifies rows in a table. Let's look at the table to clearly understand voice code normal form. In the given table, one student can enroll for multiple subjects. There can be multiple professor teaching one subject. And for each subject, a professor is assigned to the student. These are the necessary condition of this table. In this table, all the normal forms are satisfied except voice code normal form. Why? As you can see that, student ID and subject form the primary key, which means that the subject column is prime attribute. But there is one more dependency, that is, professor is depending on subject. And while subject is a prime attribute, professor is a non-prime attribute, which is not allowed by voice code normal form. Now, in order to satisfy the voice code normal form, we will be dividing the table into two parts. The table at the top will hold student ID which already exists and we will create a new column that is professor ID. And in the second table which is below will have the columns professor ID, professor and subject columns. Why do we need to have a new column that is professor ID? By doing this we are removing the non-prime attributes functional dependency. In the second table Professor ID will be the super key of that table and remaining column will be functionally dependent on it. By doing this, we are satisfying voice code normal form. So this brings us to the end of the set. Okay, we can get out of there now and go back to the slide. Um, and start talking a little more about this and kind of review what we just heard. That was a lot. Um, okay. There we go. So I have some normalization examples here. Uh, I might I want to just kind of go over this real quickly because we just went over it in the video. So um, this is the first normal form again, and this is pretty easy to see now that we went over the first normal form. Uh, we're not allowed to have these repeating values, right? We're, we're supposed to have one value in each for the first normal form. So what do we do? We uh, we take those out. We have multiple rows now, just one in the, the movie fronted um, movie fronted file. So that's pretty easy for a first normal form. Second normal form. To transform our database into second normal form, we had learned that we have to be in first normal form, first of all. Um, we have a single column primary key that does not functionally depend on the other key. In the video, he had mentioned these, um, these super keys, which could be you know, these groups of keys. And the whole thing about primary keys, you could actually have either a column or, or, or multiple columns as your primary key. I only talk about single column primary keys, because so it's easier to talk about, like in this case, like a membership ID would be your primary key, and I'm not gonna have like multiple columns be a key, because it's just confusing. Um, and that, that's what some of these things can kind of get to in normality, it's kind of kind of hairy there, so don't worry if you're confused a bit. Um, in, in the last case, though, we had um, a single column primary key that uh, did not depend on any other key, and then by splitting the two tables, we transformed ourselves into this second normal form. So then we've met this requirement of ensuring, again, that our data is in first normal form and that we have a single column primary key that does not functionally depend on any other key. Here, we went from kind of having 
all of these. We don't have this ID field. This is all kind of just, we don't satisfy that property here. We split it up. Now we have this membership ID field. So this is the single column primary key for this table. And then we have the um, single column primary key for this table as well. Uh, third normal form. To transform our database to third normal form, we must do the following. Transform in the second normal form. This is recursive in that way. Have no transitive dependencies. Transitive dependencies are those non-key columns which may cause other non-key columns to change indirectly. A good example of this is um, in the full name field uh, that we saw in this last example. Maybe I change Robert Phil to Jane Phil. Uh, Robert's salutation is Mr. And that would most likely have to change to Mrs. or Ms. So that would... Um, be a transitive dependency in that case because you're changing other data records or you're changing other attributes indirectly. So what you would do is by breaking up the customer table, again, that's what I was calling here, the customer table. Um, we have read our database of transit dependencies by creating a salutation table, which is right here in that, in that example, because we had, again, these salutations. If the, uh, those things were to change, we would have to change. Um, those are changing directly. So that's third normal form. I skipped voice cot normal form because I uh, actually it's kind of a little bit confusing. I know we covered it in the video, but um, yeah, just know that it exists. And honestly, if you ever have to develop a database from scratch, it's good to know that normalization exists and that you can use it and you might want to use it to, to kind of organize it. But that's really a job for a database administrator. Uh, if you're just working with a database, that'll probably be handled. So you don't have to worry about that too much. Okay, so now we get to the fun part, which is connecting a MySQL database to a Java application. So um, what I do here, if you don't have this available or you didn't download this, I have two links here. I'll actually just copy it into um, the chat. And uh, we can do that if you want to follow along. If not, I can just run the database here. Oh, they weren't links. They just lost. Like that. Let me see if I can just paste these ones again. No. Nah. All right. Well, you can just copy that link and then and then go there. So that's a MySQL download. So if I click on this, um, can I not click on it directly? Let me see. Paste it here then. Give me one second. So the first link is here, and you get to this MySQL community downloads. You can pick platform independent. Uh, oh, sorry, that's for the JPC driver. You can pick your operating system and then download um, the most current for your operating system. So that's that first one. And then if I go here, this JDBC MySQL download. What this is, is this is uh, JDBC stands for Java Database Connection. This is simply a driver that lets you interact with MySQL, and uh, what I did when I downloaded it was I picked a platform independent, and then I downloaded, uh, it doesn't matter which one you download, either tar or zip, I downloaded the zip and just install it from there. So you can play around with that and, and try that. If you like, you also obviously have to have Java if you're gonna connect to Java, and um, you know, it's a prerequisite. So let's, uh, let's go down to, let me see here. Let's go down to, why don't I have this here? Am I not pull up the terminal? Give me one second. Ah, uh, it's on the screen for some reason. I wanted to show you what it looks like logging into MySQL. So let me see. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. So if I wanted to log into MySQL, I have already installed MySQL. Um, I can actually let me show you that quick. If I do MySQL on the command line tool here, you get MySQL.version. I get MySQL version uh, 8.0.28. Mac OS 11, blah, blah, blah. And then if I log in using this MySQL-U demo-P, I'm using demo because that's the name of the user I created. Otherwise, this would be root um, because you're creating, or your root user is automatically created when you set up MySQL and you have to set up a password. But right now I have this demo that I want to use because I don't want to show you guys my real password. So I'm going to type in the password here. And I get into MySQL and I can do a bunch of things. So let me actually um, 
get the I want to open it up first, actually, in VS Code, because I want to do that to show you guys what I have here. So in that zip file that I gave before the workshop, it should be up there if you didn't uh, access it already. I have, let me just do this like this. I have these two files, which are create super user uh, .sql and create uh, a simple table and data. And uh, I have the simple table here, and I'm inserting this data with SQL. Again, this patient table. And I have a bunch of this data from guys in the IEEE. Um, and here also I have this create user, and I created a user demo at localhost, identified by a bad password. Don't don't show passwords and don't make passwords like this. And then I'm granting all pr uh, privileges on here. So what I can do now with that information, because I already ran that, I can actually just get to the. Um, let me do something because I think I actually I'm gonna do yeah I have to drop a demo uh, drop database demo oh is that it yeah okay so I had that already when I was testing so now what I can do is I can take the path to um, my file my simple table and data .sql file and I should be able to run it. Um, let me just actually before I do that, let me see. Oh no, yeah, I have to do something else. What was the thing? Again? Give me one second. Uh, execute. Oh yeah, the source keyword. Let me do that again. So what I want to do to actually be able to run um, my, my code here, or I want to be able to create my database, is I run this keyword source, and then I put the path to the SQL file which has my, again, my um, my data table and all the data I was adding. So I'll run that and that worked. And I did all this stuff and it added all my stuff as well. Um, what I can do now, and I won't do that now, um, but if I wanted to start up in my case and I wanted to do all this stuff from scratch, I would also run my create super user .sql to create a user for myself that I could just kind of log into and have all permissions on. You don't have to do that, but you do it in the same way as you do source and then the, the path to uh, the file that you want to run in MySQL command line. Uh, also, nice plug, if you don't want to like using command line, um, <laughs> not everyone does, there is a uh, graphical user interface you can use with MySQL called MySQL Work Workbench. I actually have it on my machine. I just didn't want to use it for this, this demonstration because I, I didn't really need it other than just doing this stuff. So, but it's pretty, it's pretty good. So now I can just quit out of here. I'll say bye, and then okay, thank you very much. And now let's go to Java. So in the file, I just, oh, yeah, there we go. So in the uh, zip file that I gave, I have this, um, this Java file here, and we can kind of go over what this is. So I have this, this, this main function here, this main method here, and um, what I did with this, and actually, before I do that, let me actually go over that as well. Uh, I have this folder in my file explorer that you might think is pretty weird is the JDBC one that I didn't mention before, or I did mention before, I didn't mention how it was relevant. So you actually have to add the jar file to the project path. Uh, in this case, I've already done that, but I can show you at least on IntelliJ how you would do that. Again, this is more or less just to kind of follow along visually. You don't have to follow along with the code. <laughs> because it can be a bit challenging. But what I did for that was I went to project structure, then I went to modules, and then here you can see I added this MySQL connector Java. And what I did was I added here, and I said jars or directories, and then I added it uh, right over there. I added this jar file. But since it's already added, I'm not gonna do that. So yeah, and here I have some of these um, functions, I have this test connection function, this list database schema function that I defined, and um, this list data and table function, and I have this void. And here I'm connecting using this, I'm getting this connection object using this driver manager get connection. And this is what I call a connection string, or not I, this is what they call a connection string. So JDBC, I'm connecting to MySQL, localhost is on port 33060. I have this user called demo password to go to bad password, and I'm connecting to this database called demo. And now you see why I made a user, because I didn't want to show my real password with a real user. 
And um, here, I'm just going to run these these functions here. And you see, actually, before I go into these, kind of what they're doing. You can see that they're actually executing SQL here. So this list database schema example, um, I'm creating a prepared statement with this con.create statement. And then I'm executing a query, and I'm typing in the statement that I want to execute. And here, I'm just saying show tables. When I do that in a certain database, it just shows me all the tables I currently have. Uh, list data and table, similar thing. I use this create statement, execute query, select all from table names. I input this table name, and I'm just using a format string there. Um, again, just displaying those each time. And uh, yeah, so let's run this and see what the output is. Yeah, so there we go. As we saw in this function I can bring up again, or this uh, file that I had before, you saw that what I had done was I created this, this uh, demo database, and I created this patient, and then I inputted all of these values. Matthew Colleen, 23, Dan E, 7, Joshua Cho, 22, James Oswald, negative 1, and Max Allen, 12. And what I did here just now was I displayed all of those values. So I iterated pretty much. Well, first of all, I checked the connection. And then I said, OK, list all the tables. We only have one table right now, which is the patient. And then in the records, I went through each uh, record in the patient table and listed them all out. So this, I know it was kind of fast paced. I apologize for that. But if you have any questions about setting this up, I can probably work better one on one with you because doing this in a video format is kind of hard. But this is one of the greatest things. Like, I love this about uh, development that you can just link databases to this stuff and driver software and everything is really cool. So I'll, I'll be glad to help out with that if you want to help out. But yeah, so let me go back to my um, presentation here. I can I find it? There we go. And okay, so. Oh, that was a surprise. Uh, play some current slide. Uh, closing remarks. If you take anything away from this presentation, it's that data and databases are extremely useful. Without these tools, any software we create would be, practically speaking, useless because it can't interface really with the real world. It doesn't really matter. Uh, if you want to learn more about databases, I recommend you look at the resources on the next slide. Take a course on databases. I know CS410 here is, is database systems. I took that and it's where I learned a lot of this stuff, um, and see what you can do with uh, databases on your own. You know, there's a bunch of stuff I didn't mention, and there's a bunch of theory I know I didn't mention, and a lot of implementation I didn't mention. There's a whole wealth of stuff about databases that you can that you can look onto and, and play around with, and just do a bunch of stuff with. Synthetic data is fun too. So just there's stuff that you can use to generate random data and play around with the database. So go wild, go hog.